Hello, people. Today is Saturday, uh, Saturday the 16th. I finished this book on the 13th, 12 Years a Slave. Uh, this book kind of bounced around my house. This was My wife had bought this, uh, in large part because, you know, she loves uh, American history. She worked at Greenfield Village and did the old uh, uh, period costume thing, and she, you know, actually worked in a in a uh, in a house there in, in what they call a working house, where they cooked on a wood stove, and and there was people that were tending the fields, all of that. So she loves this shit. She loves going to to uh, to I've been to a couple of Civil War reenactments with her, and uh, uh, I don't enjoy it quite as much as she does. But uh, they're not too bad. Mostly there's kind of like hillbillies that go to these Civil War reenactments. So I'm not too crazy about them. So anyways, this was a very good book. This is not the kind of thing that I normally read because I find American history boring. But, uh, you know, the, the quest, my quest in my reading adventures is to figure out why why humanity is so fucked up and uh it, it you know it's it's a simple thing uh humanity is so fucked up because we don't know how to deal with each other when when we appear different from each other we don't know how to deal with each other when we think different from each other uh it, it's that fucking simple and, and even though it's simple there doesn't appear to be a simple answer and when I'm reading, sometimes I make a lot of notes. Sometimes I make just a few notes. And it doesn't seem to really matter whether I'm enjoying the book or, or, or what. I read this in just a few days. Uh, it was only, I think it's, it's 205 pages. It reads very quickly. Some of this shit just makes your hair stand on end. Uh... Let me get to the notes here. I ran upon a word very early in the book, quadroon. Quadroon. That means you're 25% black and you're 75% white. Uh, you know, the same thing where any peoples mix. They had the same thing in South Africa. And, and uh, you know, the, the quadroons become their own little little portion of humanity and they're probably treated different than than black people definitely treated different than white people uh i don't think there's a whole lot of reading to do in here but here's the only one. Second paragraph page 109 i hope you can't hear that fucking dog barking these idiots behind me have two two great pyrenees they fucking leave outside all the time, and that dog will bark all day long. Second paragraph. Page 109, there it is. When it was said that I would die, Master Epps, and Master Epps is, is uh, his last master. Uh, master Epps was, was not a nice guy. Any slave owner is not a nice guy. Some were, you know by degrees nicer than others. Uh, he really likes this one guy, Ford, uh, but I think that's more like uh, a Stockholm Syndrome type of thing. Uh, when it was said that I would die, Master Epps, unwilling to bear the loss, which the death of an animal... Who's this? Oh, hi, John. Yeah, no, we haven't met. Oh, you guys haven't met? No. Maybe, like, years ago. And I could have swore we met. Yeah, yeah maybe. A good handful of years ago. Yeah, yeah. like, like, ten years ago. Maybe. All right. Yeah. Oh, boy. Uh, when it was said that I would die, Master Epps, unwilling to bear... The loss, which the death of an animal worth a thousand dollars would bring upon him, concluded to incur the expense of sending to Holmesville for Dr. Wines, 
He announced to Epps that it was the effect of the climate, and there was a probability of losing me. He directed me to eat no meat and to partake of no more food than was absolutely necessary to sustain life. Several weeks elapsed, during which time, under the scanty diet to which I was subjected, I had partially recovered. One morning, long before I was in proper condition of labor, Epps appeared at the cabin door, and presenting me a sack, ordered me to the cotton field. At this time I had had no experience whatever in picking cotton. It was an awkward business indeed. While others used both hands, snatching the cotton and depositing it in the mouth of the sack, with a precision and dexterity that was incomprehensible to me, I had to seize the bowl with one hand and deliberately draw out the white, gushing blossom with the other. Uh, Solomon Northup does not actually write this book. He dictates it to another man who writes it for him. But I believe that these are his words. He was a very intelligent man, and uh, he really paints a great picture. I think that's why I picked that paragraph to read, because it kind of, you know, he goes into it in much greater detail later on. Uh, it paints a really good picture of what it would actually be like to have to pick cotton. And not everybody was, was uh, you know, the same level of picking. And I, I bet you I would have been kind of like Solomon. I, I would have been uh, uncoordinated because I can't hardly use my left hand to do something like that. But there was people that Solomon lived with in his cabin that would just whip through the fucking rows, picking cotton left and right, filling up a 200-pound sack where he could barely do 75 pounds. Uh, good and horrible. Uh, the Ford guy, he kind of treated his slaves good. They were still slaves. They didn't get paid for what they did. Uh, they pretty much ate the same shit that, that the horrible uh, masters gave them. Uh, they, they had to work all day, all year long. They got three days for Christmas where they got to fuck around and dance and, and uh, eat a feast. Uh, contrast with the North. The book that I read called uh, The Dawn of Detroit was about slavery in, in Michigan, in Detroit. Uh, the, the, the time period that that book was written. Michigan was a fucking wilderness. So was the area around Detroit. But there was slaves here. Not too many. And, and the slaves were very hard to come by. So, so they got treated a little bit different. Supply and demand. It was that simple, you know. The, uh, they were so hard to come by that, that, you know, the owner of the property was liable to be out in the field working right next to the slave. Uh, the Bayou Hellhole. Where Solomon was, was in Alabama on some bayou. I couldn't pronounce the fucking name anyway. It's one of those French things. But it, it was just a fucking hellhole. There was thousands and thousands of slaves on all these plantations around there. They planted cotton, they planted corn, and they planted sugar cane. And uh, some of these sugar cane places were humongous, and, and, and they had thousands of slaves. In fact, the sugar cane people would, would rent slaves off of other landowners when it was time to cut the shit down. Uh, he died in 1863, and he gets rescued in 1853, and they really don't go into the, the balance of his life at all. I would have been very interested to see what Solomon thought about uh, about the Civil War, and, and uh, you know, it's too bad that he, he died before it ended. But, uh, yeah, they don't go into it at, at all, and I'm not sure if they even know where this guy died and, and what he died from. That's about it. Uh, this is a really good book if you haven't read it. I mean, this is a bestseller. A lot of people have already read this thing. Like I say, it sat around the house here for eight years, and I, I looked at it and I said, why the fuck haven't I read this? Uh, it's, it's, apparently it's a very good movie, too, and I haven't seen that either. Thanks for watching.